Good morning, all. Uh, I'm not starting the meeting, but just a big thank you to the brave souls that have uh, navigated the maze at this early hour. And so we're waiting three, four minutes more to allow people who obviously thought that it was in the other part of the building and might have to, to find their way. But um, thanks a lot for being there uh, early, and it's, uh, it's great to have you here. Actually, I'm thinking that a good use of the time might be uh, to have an introduction of those who are here, because not everybody knows absolutely everybody, I think a lot, but can we start from the, uh, from the end? That would be good. Uh, the usual procedure is you push the button, it gets red, and normally you speak. <laughs> good morning, my name is Ana Cristina Carvalho. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> sorry. I am a professor at Mackenzie Presbyterian University in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, until last uh, June, I was a postdoctoral fellow at CG, the Centre for International Governance Innovation, where I worked with in the international law stream. Hi, I'm Mariana Canto. I'm Brazilian too. And I'm a <laughs> student uh, at UFPE in Pernambuco, Recife, Brazil. And I'm also a researcher in a group, a extension group in my university. And my specialization is intellectual property and new technologies. Hello, uh, my name is Adrian Koster. I'm a policy and legal advisor for the Swiss governmental CERT. Uh, good morning, Jim Prendergast, the Galway Strategy Group, and I am a recovering internet governance addict. Okay, now it's work. Good morning, Tarek Kamel. I uh, work uh, for ICANN here in uh, Geneva. I'm heading government and IGO engagement. Good morning. My name is Peter Koch. I work for DINIC, a country code top level domain registry, and I do uh, a bit of policy advice and, in this context, external relations. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Bernd Neuer from the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Good morning, I'm Peter Major, Vice Chair of the Commission on Science and Technology for Development. Uh, Roberto Gaetano, Chairman of the Board of Public Interest Registry and uh, in the member of the Board of the European RALO. Is this working? Oh, yeah. Carla Lefevre with Google. I am VentServe's Chief of Staff. Hello, my name is Nikolata Krstic. Uh, I am a student of University of Ljubljana, and I'm also an intern in Diplo Foundation and an online moderator. Well, good morning. My name is Vince Cerf. I'm a Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, and I do what Carla tells me to do. And I'm Paul Mitchell. I'm from Microsoft. Hello, I'm Paul Fellinger. I'm the Deputy Director of the Secretariat of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Good morning. I'm Pamela Miller. I'm the Director General of Telecom and Internet Policy for the Department of Innovation and Economic Development Canada. Hi all, I'm Daniel Abadi. I'm the Under Secretary of Digital Government for Argentina. I'm Byron Holland. I'm the President and CEO of the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, the CCTLD operator for Canada. Hi, good morning. I'm Guilherme Canella. I'm a UNESCO advisor for Latin America and the Caribbean. Is it working? Um, Elena Lopatina. Council of Europe Information Society Department. Good morning, I'm Benedicto Fonseca from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil. So, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Jonah Hill, I'm with the US Department of Commerce. Um, and this is Fiona Alexander, she can't speak, so <laughs> she, I will introduce her. Uh, she is also uh, with the US Department of Commerce. 
Uh, good morning. I'm Xavier Guillaume de Camille. I work with Bertrand Paul and Martin uh, in the Secretariat of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jacques Devera. I'm a professor of intellectual property law and internet law at the University of Geneva, where I'm also vice rector. Good morning. My name is Niels Lestrade. I work for the Dutch Police National Intelligence Division, and we're also responsible for open source intelligence. Good morning. My name is Annick Monsou. I'm a colleague uh, for Niels, also from the Dutch National Police. Uh, Richard Wingfield from Global Partners Digital. Morning, Ian Brown from um, the UK Government Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. And previously I was Professor of Information Security and Privacy at Oxford University. Good morning, my name is Rahul Gosai and I'm from the Government of India in the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. I'm a director and I deal with the internet governance issues. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patrick Ryan. I'm with Engineering Program Management at, in the Google Cloud Platform. Hi, I'm Flavio Wagner. I'm a professor at the University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil and affiliated to the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Hi, I'm Diego Canabajo and I work as an advisor to the board of uh, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Steve Dalbianco with NetChoice, a trade association of e-commerce companies based in the U.S. Hi, my name is Andrew Bridges. I'm a partner at Fenwick and West in San Francisco. I'm a litigator and I defend new technologies and business models. Hi, everybody. I'm Bohan. I'm from Tsinghua University in China and a PhD student. Vint is right. Uh, you're allowed to use this a little bit strange structure um, of a room. So if you want to come to the, the central parts, uh, you are highly welcome. Well, perhaps even more important, uh, not only would you be welcome, but you will also be on the script so that other people who are remote will uh, see what you have to say. So Absolutely. I would really like to strongly invite you to move where the microphones are. Thank you very much, Vint. Uh, actually, it's a right thing to also remind us that there are people who are uh, participating remotely, and um, I strongly encourage them to uh, ask questions if uh, they have any uh, in the course of this, um, of this session. There are a certain number of familiar faces around the table here, and also new people that, uh, that I'm very um, uh, pleased to, to welcome. So I'm Bertrand La Chapelle. I'm the executive director of the Secretariat of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. And the purpose of this session is to uh, bring people up to date on what is the process and where we are. Uh, the title of this slide deck is, as you see, Paris, Ottawa, Berlin, because as you will see, it is the successive milestones of the Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference. That took place, the first one in Paris, in the end of 2016. The next one will take place in cooperation with the, uh, the Government of Canada, uh, and Pamela Miller is, is here, uh, in February, at the end of February 2018, and the third one will take place in Germany, in Berlin, in June 2019, in partnership with the, uh, the government of Germany, and in particular the, minister, uh, the Ministry for Economy and Energy. But what we're talking about is not only a series of conferences, uh, the issues that we are addressing and the uh, uh, problems that we try to tackle together, are not going to be solved with successions of uh, one and a half hour panels, uh, however interesting they might be, and they sometimes are. 
Uh, the, um, the goal is to have an ongoing process and the Internet and Jurisdiction um, Policy Network has actually started in 2012, so it's an ongoing um, discussion that is now structured in the way that I will, that I will present. But maybe before getting into the way it works uh, in the policy network itself, it's probably interesting to have a look at uh, How do we get to the next slide? Ah, oh, sorry, I was not on the thing. So um, I hope it's, it's visible. I just want to, to reiterate the, um, the challenges that we are all confronted with. It's not an exhaustive coverage of this, but it is a context that we have to take into account because we're basically in an environment that is driven by high uncertainty. And I don't have to, to belabor and to um, illustrate in too much detail what I'm talking about, but there's uncertainty about how the national laws apply to cross-border applications or cross-border cyberspace in general. Uh, an element of uncertainty is perfectly illustrated by uh, very concrete facts like the fact that the world is hanging on the results of a few court cases. The right to be de-indexed case in, the, in Europe completely created a new uh, environment, a new, new type of right and a new type of practice. The uh, Schrems case uh, obliterated in one swoop the, uh, the whole architecture of privacy and personal data exchange on both sides. We're all hanging and waiting for the uh, resolution of the famous Microsoft case in the Supreme Court in the US uh, probably mid, mid next year. And cases after cases are, are coming in. You may have seen that no later than yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, the European Court of Justice has decided that Uber is a transportation uh, service, which is completely changing the regulatory environment. So without getting into more detail, the problem is that this uncertainty and the absence of frameworks that allow for setting the norms and setting the rules so that people can adapt to those is encouraging and even forcing a certain number of actors to take unilateral actions that uh, are not necessarily coordinated and can produce a legal arms race, which means that it can be governments, it can be companies, everybody is reacting to the urgency of issues, to the pressure of the need to do something. And the cumulative effect of all these individual decisions make it uh, particularly difficult to have a, a comprehensive environment. The end result is high costs because if you have to plan, for instance, the development or the um, uh, creation of data centers around the world, if you don't know what the legal uh, environment will be, uh, it's extremely difficult. Uh, if you have to, um, as a company, prepare for legal costs uh, of different procedures, it's also a big question mark, but it goes for governments as well. It goes for governments that are hesitating on whether they should adopt a particular national law, push their existing law in extraterritorial application, etc. So this environment is what is labeled as a dangerous path and clearly calls for um, elements of, of, of cooperation on a certain number of cross-border challenges. When we say internet and jurisdiction, the fundamental problem is the tension between the cross-border nature of one and the territoriality of the international system. This is not a criticism on each part, it is just a fact. Those two things have to adapt or adjust in a certain way to one another. And of course it's an enormous range of issues and in order to be able to tackle them, the purpose is to identify a certain number that are actionable where the different actors have a common problem to solve. And in the course of the work that we facilitated as a secretariat, the partners and the actors have identified three main tracks and three main problems. One is the question uh, that can be labeled in different ways, but uh, one way is to say uh, access to e-evidence in the cloud. You have an investigation, a criminal investigation in one country, and the data that is necessary for this investigation is actually held by a private company that is either located in another country or has its storage facilities in the other country than the one doing the investigation. 
Here again, without getting into more detail, the key problem is that the international mechanism for legal assistance is a pretty cumbersome one and probably adapted to a period where the number of cases was much less than it is today. Transnational is the new norm, and the mutual legal assistance treaty system is um, definitely slow and not easily scalable. The second type of problem that we've seen in the press uh, a lot is everything that is related to objectionable content, illegal content, objectionable content, and the conditions under which this content should be removed, filtered, uh, restricted, partially or totally, by the main operators um, and the main platforms, particularly when we're talking about user-generated content. And without getting into details, the key question is what, are, what is the applicability of national laws? Are there cases where you need or it is legitimate to have a global takedown because of the importance of the harm, etc.? And what is the responsibility, respectively, of the private and the public actors? The third element is something that in this community is um, in the minds of people, and particularly in the ICANN community, but that in the rest of the world is not probably paid sufficient attention to. It's the fundamental question of the domain name system and the uh, registries and registrars are a neutral technical layer that is essential for the functioning of the internet. And there is a question which is, when is it legitimate, appropriate, efficient to take down or suspend a domain name because of the activity that is on the site underneath? It is a tricky issue, I don't get into the details, but it is something where you have to distinguish probably between what is labeled as infrastructure abuse, like phishing, malware, botnets, and things like that, that are more related to the stability of the system, and what is labeled, by lack of a better word, as uh, abusive content, which can go from child abuse images to copyright, and in between, uh, unsafe pharmaceuticals, uh, counterfeiting, and other, and other things. So defining when and how it is appropriate or not to use the domain name layer for content purposes and what is the role of notifiers is um, a, key, a key question. This led to three tracks, access to user data, content restrictions, and domain suspensions with the, um, the formulation of the general uh, questions that are, that are underneath, how do you reconcile, and I insist on the word reconcile, opposite objectives that are um, both positive. It's not about balancing or zero-sum games types of thing. In many cases, the purpose is to, at the same time, catch the bad guys and protect privacy, making it more efficient, but at the same time with more guarantees. So. The key problem in this environment is that it's one nice thing to frame the problem, and that's what we've done after, um, tried to do after the uh, Paris meeting. But there's a big challenge, which is how do you ensure policy coherence? Because there are many actors who are dealing with the same issues. And a typical example is in the case of um, access to user data. You have excellent work that is being done in the Council of Europe, in the Cybercrime Convention framework and the TCY. You have excellent work that is done as well in the European Commission as a follow-up to the uh, mission and the mandate that was given by the Council of Justice and Home Affairs in June 2016. But you also have work that is underway between the United States and the UK on a joint US-UK uh, bilateral agreement. And there is work that is done in civil society and companies in the US regarding the reform of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And overall, you have on each of the three tracks a combination of actions by governments, public authorities, international organizations, but also civil society developing principles such as the Manila principles on freedom of expression, or companies developing codes of conduct of their own, or developing their terms of service which have a capacity to establish norms for their own digital territories. So ensuring digital, uh, sorry, policy coherence and making sure that there is no contradiction and that the whole system is legally interoperable is one of the big challenges. So 
In that landscape, our role, for those who are not uh, as familiar, and I will go, go quickly, is to basically help bridge the silos, engage more than 200 entities today from the six stakeholder groups that are described above, the states, the major internet platforms, the technical operators, uh, civil society, academia, and international organizations. And I must add that in each of those groups, you have different types of, of actors. Even in governments, you have the different ministries that are um, relevant. You have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Economy, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministries of Justice, the Data Protection Authorities, various levels of law enforcement agencies, and so on, for um, an issue, for instance, like uh, user data. And likewise, for, for, the, uh, uh, for the domain space, there's a whole range of actors. So the goal is to bring them together, provide a neutral space for discussion on an ongoing basis around precise and concrete uh, issues. The three programs that I'm, that I'm mentioning, and since last year, the principle of having global internet and jurisdiction conferences. Uh, this was a change uh, and a major revolution in 2016. We did the first one, as I said, with, uh, with France, uh, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a, as a partner in Paris last year. And the next one will be with Canada, and the next one with, with Germany and the, the Federal Ministry of, of Economy, as I said. But importantly, um, not only is it the, the first time probably in 2016 that about 200 participants at a senior level from 40 countries really addressed specifically those jurisdictional questions, it is important to note that there is also a context where the uh, major international organizations also provide institutional support, including uh, the OECD, the Council of Europe, the European Commission, UNESCO, and ICANN, and we're engaging other uh, international organizations. It is an originality in the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Uh, normally, international organizations are considered as observers or they're around. Uh, we consider that particularly their secretariat, are, have a contribution to make on their own, and that is very important to also articulate existing structures with this, what one of the participants in Paris has called the, the connective tissue of, um, of internet and jurisdiction. <clears throat> very quickly, um, I was talking about policy coherence. Policy coherence requires coordination. You know the, the saying, everybody wants coordination, nobody wants to be coordinated. <laughs> We're there as a neutral facilitator to bring actors together, but this is not enough. And if you look at the quotes here from uh, Carl Bildt and um, the former uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General of the OCD in Paris uh, last year, the incentive and the emphasis is on cooperation, which is more than coordination. It's developing actual, uh, actual frameworks. And as the economist said, basically, if those issues are not addressed properly, then there is a real danger for the internet itself and the, econ the digital economy, human rights, and cybersecurity at the same time. Very quickly, the methodology is, it may sound obvious, but I want to insist on one thing. It's, it's a natural funnel. Every single methodology is starting from a larger aspect and then narrowing down towards operational solution. What is very important in the method that we're implementing is to spend a lot of time in the early stages to find common formulations for problems, for goals, for methods, because if you don't even agree on the meaning of the words, there's no reason that you will be able to agree on the solutions to the problem. So vernacular, common formulation of objectives is, is a very important element. And the goal is to move towards operational solutions. It always takes time, but the important um, name of the game here is persistence. So this leads to the, the final element, which is the, the general roadmap. You see the three milestones of Paris, Ottawa, and, and Berlin, and you have on your, on your table the, uh, uh, the, the, the written uh, form. Uh, what we did in Paris was to build on the work, the preparatory work in the three programs, and in the input documents, allow the discussion at the conference uh, in Paris 
to be focused on identifying what was labeled as areas of cooperation. Uh, one important element for those who were not at the Paris conference who don't know about it, the format was a little bit special because there was no panels at all. It was two days over three days, one afternoon in plenary, one full day, and one morning in plenary. And the full day was divided in parallel in the three, um, in the three tracks. So imagine that there's a wall in, in there and there's the three um, groups in parallel devoting a whole full day to the documents that were the input documents. And the outcome was as synthetic as possible because it was basically four, maximum five, areas for cooperation, i.e. teams, that were uh, to be uh, explored further. That's the outcome of, uh, of Paris. That led to the formation of three contact groups that we purposefully didn't call working groups. They are not representative, they are not decision making, but the intention was to have, and some in this room uh, were part of those working group, uh, contact groups, the goal was to make sure that the perspective of the different options for solutions were all taken into account. There were six, uh, sorry, seven virtual meetings um, by teleconference. We prepared as secretariat the input document and the questions for those, uh, for those calls and prepared the minutes afterwards. And the result of this is uh, what is called um, policy options documents that I will uh, mention uh, briefly afterwards, that fundamentally will serve as input into the second uh, conference in Ottawa in February, at the end of February, that will have exactly the same format. And this format will be um, building on the structure of the, um, of, the three, uh, of the three documents. So I want to speed up a little bit because of the time. The purpose in Ottawa, and uh, we can elaborate afterwards, is to align people on common objectives. On the basis of these input documents, the dream and the objective is that people say, we know there's still a distance to um, uh, travel to get to the results, but at least we're trying to go in the same direction. We want to formulate the goals in a common manner and structure the different elements that have to be explored further in the period. And on that basis, the same methodology will be applied, but probably a little bit more structured, not only virtual meetings, but also physical ones. And part of the, the challenge is to define the best methodology to be manageable and as inclusive as possible. Final element uh, to um, encourage you, the, uh, the goal is to develop cooperation frameworks or to sorry, facilitate discussion for the different participants to develop cooperation frameworks, the form of which will be determined in the end. Nobody knows how formal or informal the result will be. The focus of the work is on the substantive content of the agreements. Uh, for those of you who are in the ICANN, familiar with the ICANN environment, there's a nice pun on mutual affirmation of commitments instead of uh, just bilateral affirmation of commitments, but the general idea is to explore any kind of mechanism where the, the different actors, public, private, and civil society can say, if you commit to do this, then I commit to do that, and they will be monitoring what we do together in substance. So after Paris, we produced these documents that you can find online that are called framing papers with the areas for cooperation. That was the product at the beginning of 2017. And as a result of the contact groups in 2017, we produced and released very recently in, in November the uh, so-called policy options documents that I encourage you to download on the, on the site, internetandjurisdiction.net uh, slash policy options, I think. Uh, and for those of you who will be uh, coming uh, to, to Ottawa, uh, it will be very important to have read them before so that we can discuss them with detail. And also for those of you who might be interested in knowing more about the Ottawa conference, we can have the discussion uh, afterwards. So final line is it's always difficult to define a mission uh, in great detail, but what I want to share is that all of us 
are in a situation where we are under extreme pressure to deal with very day-to-day -day urgencies. And we are all dealing with them in silos, which means that we're all in prisoner's dilemma situation. You have to do quickly a decision without knowing what the others are, are, are going to do. This is usually not going in game theory into uh, uh, good uh, results. So the purpose of our work as a secretariat is to help actors in a structured process, not to get into purely academic thinking, although academic thinking is important, but not thinking uh, long-term 20 years, but having the capacity to step back a little and get into the structural solution rather than treating the symptoms. And so that's the, uh, the general mission. The goal is that the internet to continue to flourish and the digital society needs cooperation framework that is as transnational as the internet itself. And this is a process that attempts modestly and ambitiously to, to help the actors uh, participate. So I've been long, but uh, if you want more information, you can go to the site, and then I will um, pass the baton to, uh, to Paul for the, the rest of the, uh, of the session. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we are very happy um, that today here with us in the room are several members of the advisory group um, for the second Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference that is going to take place on February 26, 28 uh, next year. And um, we would like to invite the members and representatives of members who could not be with us today in the room um, to basically tell the participants at the IGF why Ottawa matters and why this is such an important opportunity for the community to proceed um, towards the path of developing policy standards and operational solutions. And maybe I would like to start with um, Pam Miller, who is the Director General of IACD Canada. We are very delighted that Canada is the partner for the second Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and first, Canada very much looks forward to hosting the second Internet and Jurisdiction Conference in Ottawa, which is fast approaching at the end of February. Our, the key partners are the Government of Canada and the Canadian Internet Registry. And why, in brief, did Canada agree to host and what do we hope to achieve? Canada is a very strong supporter of the open and interoperable Internet, as we all are, but we know the challenges, as Bertrand has eloquently described. INJ really stands out in bringing research to bear and looking for coordinated solutions. The focus in Ottawa will be on defining specific problems as identified by the INJ community related to content, data, and domains. Already in preparation for the conference, there are tangible impacts in the contact groups, and I would have to say also domestically. In Canada, we have a partnership across government with numerous departments, including my own, Innovation, Science, and Economic Development, also with Global Affairs, Justice, Heritage, our regulator, the CRTC, and as I noted, our, our internet registry, the Canadian CIRA. We are consulting with privacy, law enforcement, private sector, academia. This is a really important impact of INJ to mobilize these types of conversations. Preparations are well underway, and I think the time is right. I think Ottawa is an opportunity to define specific problems and blockage areas, and I really sense momentum and purpose. I would note that in addition to being a supporter of INJ, Canada will be hosting the G7. It will be an important opportunity for Canada to engage G7 counterparts on pressing global challenges and pursue further collaboration on innovation and clean growth. The impacts of digital technologies on inclusive innovation will need to be factored into the discussions, and internet and jurisdiction matters are an integral part of this. So again, we're very much looking forward to the conference and again, the focus on solutions and the path forward to Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, maybe I start on the right-hand side um, with Tari Kamel, who's um, Senior Vice President at ICANN. In one minute, please, because we have also to look at the time, why does Ottawa matter? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And uh, indeed, ICANN as well um, is uh, very keen to participate and support uh, the Internet and Jurisdiction um, uh, Initiative. Uh, we will have participation on management level as well as on board level in uh, the conference, similar to what we did in Paris. Um, we think that the debate of jurisdiction and DNS outside ICANN as well 
gives more flexibility for brainstorming. ICANN is focused on policy making uh, uh, very specifically, but we have challenges uh, definitely that are uh, related uh, to the area of jurisdiction. GDPR is not the first and not the least. E-privacy um, is, um, is coming. So exchanging data across borders related to DNS management is going to be um, a challenge and needs the collective wisdom of uh, the community uh, uh, to provide input to the ICANN decision-making process and policy development process. So we look forward uh, to uh, participate in Ottawa and uh, we will continue to support the initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next will be um, Mr. Um, um, Bernd Neuer, who's here for um, advisory group member Stefan Schnorr, the Director General of the Ministry of Economics. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, first, best regards from my Director General, Stefan Schnorr. And he asked me to say <coughs> that, uh, and uh, maybe most of you have heard about, that German uh, federal government decided <coughs> in summer this year that Germany should apply for the IGF 2019. Um, we have proposed to host the IGF um, at the end of November. And we think, or we hope, that the new federal government will also support and continue this project, this application from Germany, from, from our ministry. Uh, we think the Internet and Jurisdiction Conference can be an important milestone on the way to the IGF 2019. And uh, first of all, to help us generate input. Therefore, Germany proposed to hold the third annual conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Conference, um, as Bertrand said, in June 2019. We are convinced that the Internet and Jurisdiction Conference and the project as well is a long-term issue, a long-term value, and it can only be, be successful with concrete outcomes that can be followed up even after Ottawa. <clears throat> uh, and finally, I would like to say Germany is ready to pick up the momentum set by France and Canada especially against the background uh, of the IGF 2019 planned for Berlin. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we're extremely happy that um, Germany already announced before um, the second Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference to be the partner for the third one. Next one um, would be um, Vin Cerf, who doesn't need an introduction, I believe. Um, please. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, I think that we have in the Internet uh, a very, very powerful enabling technology, and much has happened over the course of the 40 years since its invention and the 30-plus years of operation. But at the same time, by lowering the barriers to exchange of information, access to it, uh, we've also uh, invited into this environment uh, activity which is, in fact, harmful, and we need to find ways of protecting uh, our, our interests in this environment. So the reason that it's important for these meetings to take place is that we have to find a way to protect that which needs protection without destroying the enabling capacity of the Internet. And to do that uh, in an international setting uh, where uh, cross-border jurisdictional questions arise is a non-trivial problem but it is worthy of our attention, and that's why I will be in Ottawa, and I certainly will be in Berlin uh, as these events unfold. Thank you very much, Vint. Um, to my right is um, Paul Mitchell, um, Senior Director at Microsoft. So I'll agree with everything that's just been said, and uh, just note that Bertrand mentioned the seminal cases that are uh, at play, including you know, Uber yesterday and everyone's waiting on the, the Microsoft warrant case. Uh, nothing that the, the INJ project is doing is likely to stop the, uh, uh, the, the efforts by national administrations to create law, case law on uh, internet related topics. But what the INJ project can do is create 
lots and lots of input. When we, when we come together in a multi-stakeholder fashion to agree on cooperation mechanisms, to agree on ways that we can share information, to agree on what common values are, that all can provide great input into the system of laws and regulations that we have globally. Without that, just speaking from the perspective of a global cloud provider, we just have chaos in, how, in terms of how we operate our services. I'll note just for interest that there are a number of amicus briefs that have been filed at the U.S. Supreme Court already on the Microsoft Warren case, and they make fascinating reading for everyone in this room. Um, most of them are in favor of neither side, which is an interesting <laughs> way to, uh, to write these briefs. But, uh, but I think this is a really important uh, area. And at the conference in Paris last year, I noted that we sort of have to move from categorizing or cataloging um, activities to some way to actually uh, create action and create uh, common frameworks and common understanding. And I think the three uh, papers that have come out uh, over the past year actually go some distance down that path uh, in terms of, of creating some commonality, at least a framework that, that we, can, uh, we can leverage. So we're completely supportive, like look forward to being uh, in Ottawa, which is in fact a beautiful city even when it's freezing cold. So please come. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, uh, Under Secretary um, um, Daniel um, um, Abadi, you're here for um, Secretary uh, Wuji, and um, you have the floor. Thank you. First of all, um, congratulations to Beltran and his team for setting this and setting this momentum. Um, Ottawa gave us the opportunity as a community to discuss and build a, a framework if it's necessary. Uh, I guess it's time to get together, to work, and you know, get the usual internet base that is community and discuss in a multi-stakeholder way, and build a framework. On, and that, you know, as Canada will be hosting the G7, Argentina will be hosting the G20, we pick up what the German presidency did on the Digital Economy Task Force, and that's also an opportunity for develop and developing countries to include the, this thing in this new, you know, economy model where we are globalizing and exchanging ideas and innovation. So Ottawa will be a great platform to discuss things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, the next one in, in line is, um, is, is Byron Holland, and with a special thank you to Sierra, who together with the Government of Canada are helping us with the Secretariat to prepare all the logistical aspects of the conference. Byron is the CEO and President of, of Sierra. So thank you very much for, to the INJ team for uh, putting this event together. As an operator, uh, often our, as a CCTLD operator, we spend most of our time on operational functions and in the in the day-to-day -day weeds. And it's often difficult to deal with the higher level conceptual and policy issues that confront us all. As a day-to-day -day operator, we're confronted with those issues, in particular in the Canadian context every day, given where we live, the majority of our data, even in a Canadian point-to-point -point exchange, uh, flows through Euro uh, foreign jurisdiction through the US. So we confront the kinds of issues that are being discussed on a daily basis, and yet we do it in the context where there aren't solutions. And I, I certainly believe that the INJ project is really the, the next internet governance frontier that we, that we need to address with this global resource. So I want to thank the team for bringing together the appropriate parties and the uh, and the appropriate expertise to discuss these issues. And I look forward to being the sponsor and co-host of uh, the event with the Canadian government. Uh, yes, Canada can be cold in February, but it can also be uh, beautiful. You will be at a UNESCO World Heritage site, literally, on the banks of uh, the longest skating rink uh, in, in the world. So please also bring your skates, or at the very least, bring your gloves and your hat. Um, I, I, I do want to assure you that the conference center is linked to the hotel and many entertainment facilities, so you don't actually have to go outside, but I would strongly encourage you to take advantage of the environment when you're there. Thanks. But just a note for participating delegates, skating is recommended just after the conference, not before. <laughs>
Um, I would like to give the floor to Guillermo Canella, who's here for um, the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, Frank LaRue. Yes, good morning. Best regards from Frank. He needed to be in Washington today, so he asked me to join this and on his behalf and also because perhaps I can add a, uh, another element up for this discussion and why Ottawa is so important. Uh, I'm coordinating for UNESCO a global initiative on training judges on those issues, freedom of expression and internet. And uh, in Latin America, we have trained more than 6,000 judges in 23 countries. And I think the most uh, common questions from all of those judges and prosecutors is about internet jurisdiction. The very three issues you mentioned uh, are the questions those judges that are not asking this for intellectual curiosities because they have actual cases on their desks. So I, we think this is super important and I, we would, as UNESCO, strongly encourage you to invite actual judges to be in your conference because these people, uh, they are actually discussing case, real cases, they are receiving all, and not only in supreme and higher courts, but in very initial jurisdictions in their national county, in, the, in our member states. And finally, uh, UNESCO General Conference has constantly asking the Secretariat to provide our member states with this very same kind of discussions you are raising here and in those different conferences. So for us as a Secretariat, it's, it's highly important to be fit in with this kind of discussions to then uh, return to our member states upon their request. So thank you very much. And UNESCO will be, of course, be represented there and, and then feedback in these discussions to this judges initiative and to our member states in our general conference. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we are honored as the secretary to have UNESCO's institutional support for the conference and also the institutional support of the Council of Europe. Elena Lopatina is here for um, advisory group member Patrick Panix. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, just a couple of words to, um, on behalf of Mr. Patrick Panix, head of Information Society Department of the Council of Europe and also, as Paul said, member of the advisory group to share our <coughs> vision on this initiative. So the Council of Europe sees the upcoming conference as a very important event and as a real opportunity for all stakeholders to work out policies and solutions through joint co coordinated action. And the multi-stakeholder model, which is one of the key features of the conference, is absolutely capable of providing and a very enabling environment for that. The Council of Europe itself engages in promoting the multi-stakeholder model. We engage in working with NGOs, with the academia, and since recently with businesses as well. And our vision is that to face the challenges of the digital transformation, it is important that all stakeholders recognize their respective duties, responsibilities, obligations, and work together They're guided by the principles of human rights, democracy, and rule of law for which the Council of Europe stands. And having said this, I'm pleased to recall that the Council of Europe supports the conference, including through participating in the thematic working groups, and we do that actually because we believe that all stakeholders, including international organizations, should and shall engage in a concerted action towards our shared digital future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Benedito Fonseca Fio is the Director um, of Scientific and Technological Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Please, Benedito, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Brazil, as you know, has been an early supporter of this project, uh, and actually we are, uh, of course, very proud to have him hosted Net Mundial, and one of the calls emanating from Net Mundial was that jurisdiction in the context of internet governance should be further developed uh, as a priority uh, uh, area of work in the future, so we are very glad to see that it is developing through internet and jurisdiction project. Uh, jurisdiction is a very, uh, I would say, urgent and increasingly important issue. I, I would say besides those three focus areas that were chosen by the project, there are also a number of international discussions uh, involving jurisdiction aspects. Just to name one that is particularly uh, uh, dear to my country is a discussion going on in ICANN regarding how we can make sure that one organization that deals with global resources, uh, what kind of jurisdiction uh, rules should govern this organization. Presently, we have a unilaterally forced jurisdiction, which from the perspective of uh, foreign countries is not 
the appropriate way. We are looking to ways to, to deal with that. But there are many other aspects regarding jurisdiction, and I think this adds a complexity to this discussion. Uh, Bertrand has mentioned that from the perspective of governments, there is, there is it's not a monolithic thing. Uh, different branches within the executive have, may have different views, uh, and Guilherme has indicated that judges, so judiciary, another branch of government, uh, is also there. If we add Congress to that, the three branches of government we, <laughs> and all those interacting uh, and taking decisions that can impact on jurisdiction, we see the, the landscape is really very complex. So the added value uh, that internet and jurisdiction brings to this, as was indicated by uh, the previous uh, <coughs> intervener, is that it can certainly not provide a direct uh, answer, but it can provide very important inputs, valuable information to help to guide us through all this maze. And uh, I would uh, just finalize by saying that Internet and Jurisdiction Project is the unique in itself because many efforts have been going on in regard to jurisdiction. But when we think of international effort, of multi-stakeholder nature, I would say Internet and Jurisdiction Project uh, is really uh, something very unique and uh, we uh, see a very great value in, in pursuing it. So we are looking forward to Ottawa and Berlin as milestones in further developing our common shared understanding on ways that can be used to address and tools to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedito. And then if I may add, what makes this effort, I, I believe, unique is precisely the engagement of the stakeholders. We as the secretariats are there to enable the cooperation and to help, and um, we're delighted to see this momentum building up ahead of Ottawa and the engagement of the stakeholders. Um, Fiona Alexander um, of, of NTIA um, is a member of the High Level Advisory Group, um, but I think John will uh, take the floor. In, I'll, do, in, in, I'll do my uh, in, best in Fiona years. impression here. Um, no, I'll, I'll speak for myself. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Paul Bertrand. Um, you know, the U.S. Department of Commerce has long been a supporter of the Internet and Jurisdiction uh, First Project and now Policy Network. Um, thank you. you know, I, I'll just echo quickly what, what others have said. You know, uh, 2018 is going to be a... Uh, busy year for these issues. Um, we're going to have the GDPR come into effect in May. Um, there's the Schrems 2 case uh, that's forthcoming, the Microsoft Ireland case, um, the uh, Cybersecurity Act, uh, Cybersecurity Law in China um, has already come into effect, but is really going to start being uh, enforced and implemented. Um, so I think you know uh, the the time is really right for these kind of discussions um, to to really um, um, you know. Come, come, to a, uh, uh, come to a place where um, we can start to make progress and really start to move forward on these issues. Um, and the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, I think, is the only place that I'm aware of that all of these uh, uh, interconnected issues are brought together in one place. Um, so, you know, it is a, it's a unique venue. It's a unique a uh, group of individuals who really have expertise in uh, all of these various topics from uh, ICANN issues to privacy to law enforcement. Um, so uh, we're very much excited about uh, Ottawa and then Germany uh, and look forward to, to participating and keeping the conversation going with, uh, with uh, the group. Thank you very much. Um, we have four minutes left and um, we um, I think can, can take um, one or two questions either to the Secretariat of the Policy Network or the members of the advisory group here in the room. Yes, please. If you allow me, it's, it's more than a question, it's, um, um, it's uh, a comment. Um, among all the um, voices that I've heard, uh, there are two voices that are missing, and I happen to have two hats. One as a, as a global registry and another one as a, as a, a user representative in ALAC. And I think that it is essential that those two parts uh, will be also part of, the, of, um, of this effort. 
because uh, registries uh, and their network of registrars are, are severely affected by the difference in jurisdiction, even more than the CCTLDs. Um, and, uh, and the users, uh, the, the classical case of a user in Africa that has a registrar in Europe and uh, the registry in the, in the US, which jurisdiction applies. And uh, so I, I think that it is important that we bring to this process also the voices and the problems that uh, uh, those two categories of stakeholders have. And also in order to maintain uh, this uh, global effort uh, in, uh, in the framework of a real multi-stakeholder uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Vint would like to, to comment. If, you know, thank you. I just wanted to make two observations. First of all, there is no doubt in my mind that to solve the problems that we all have uh, in thinking about, we are going to need cooperation across national boundaries. There's simply no other way. Second point is that we are going to have to answer the question, who has what authority to do what? And we are also going to have to answer, how will we maintain due process in the course of solving these problems? And finally, what role does informality play in solving some of these problems? And I put that on the table very deliberately. When we become overly formal, as the law demands, we sometimes interfere with our own ability to solve problems. And so I think th there is an amalgam of challenge here that we will not totally overcome in Ottawa, but I hope we'll make some progress. Maybe a few, a few other questions. Unless we're kicked out, we can grab another five minutes because we started late because of the trick. Yes. There was Jim over there who... Sure, uh, thank you, Jim Prendergast. I would say first off, the selection of Ottawa in February is brilliant because nobody will ever be accused of going on a junket. Um, the other thing, I remember back to the Paris event and looking at the program and saying, my gosh, we're going to be in a discussion track for an entire day. And that was kind of daunting and it turned out to be excellent. Um, the issues are very complex. You can't get through it, Bertrand, as you said, in a 90-minute session. Um, it takes time to navigate the different opinions and, and angles that people want to talk about. So I'm not sure what the program, if, if it's set up like that for Ottawa, but Same you know, a day is not intimidating. You probably go two or three, but you know, I, 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 like the, I like that length of, so you can really get into the issues and sort of wrestle them to the ground. Any other comment, Jan? Um, just very briefly, um, I had a brilliant time skating in Ottawa a few uh, winters ago, so I, I highly <laughs> recommend it as a junket. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make, Vint, I thought your point about informality is really interesting and, and really needs a, a lot of development. I'm very glad the Council of Europe is involved because human rights issues obviously are so important. And traditionally, I'm not saying it will always be like this, but um, legality, you know, very precise specification of powers and tests of proportionality and so on are such a core part of international human rights law. I think that will be part of the discussion. Any, any other uh, comment, question? Yes, yeah, Just a quick comment and building on what Vince said. It, of course, it's, it's, it's inform, informality is very important, but how do you formalize informality is the bigger uh, question, probably. And that's what we're grappling with. Uh, Will there be remote participation? Just, just a note, because uh, the Africa is happening right at the same time. The, uh, the, the quick answer is the, the structure of the conference, as I said, is in there are plenaries and there's the work streams on the second day. The plenaries will be webcast. It's not really remote participation, but there will be webcast. People will be able to, to follow it and it will be posted afterwards on, online. You can see, for instance, the sessions of last year uh, online. But the second day is a working day on Chatham House rules, and so therefore we, we make it for the people who are there. I, t I take the opportunity because there's, there's a, a natural lingering question and it's always a challenge. And just as Vint was mentioning informality and formality, there's the whole question of how do you manage the maximum inclusion and still be manageable. I want to insist, and it's a very important uh, commitment, uh, what we're doing first is that it's really an effort to be as neutral as possible and have all the different perspectives represented. And so uh, to reassure uh, Roberto, 
be it um, the community of registries and registrars and the community of um, civil society groups and maybe in, including uh, for the case, the question of domains even more, the, the ALAC is, is clearly the structure, that, that's the case. But the point that I, want to, that I want to make is that, as I explained, this is not just the conferences. It's a little bit like the ITF, you know. In the ITF, you do not adopt something at physical meetings, ever. You validate them through online consensus building and so on. Yes, there's the reputation of humming and so on. But the principle is only a certain number of people have the possibility to come or are uh, selected to be part of, a, of an event. So what we do in, in Ottawa is to really catalyze the maximum critical mass of actors that are sufficiently representative of the diversity of viewpoints. And I insist on the distinction. It is not about having delegates that are representing. We do not pretend that the whole community is representative of the whole world. What we think is we're trying the best we can to have the diversity of viewpoints taken into account so that it frames the discussion for afterwards. And the, the commitment in particular is because of the limitation and the natural limitation of resources, all regions of the world are not covered exactly in the same way. We've made a strong effort to, to cover uh, a large number of countries and, and actors. And a huge effort is uh, intended in 2018 going towards Berlin to do a intensive outreach to, uh, to other regions. And that covers in particular uh, Africa and Asia, which is an enormous um, uh, piece, and, and the Middle East. Latin America is relatively uh, engaged. So I want to, to highlight this because the process and the inclusion, we are constantly searching and looking for the right people who are not only knowledgeable about the topic, who are in positions where they are capable of influencing it by their ideas or by their position, but also, and it's an important criteria, seriously wanting to help develop solutions. And it, it looks completely mundane, but it is an important criteria, and we want that everybody who comes to Ottawa or participates in the, in the physical meetings, in spite of their differences, in spite of their different perspectives and even starting point or angles of vision on a particular topic, have one thing in common, that they care about finding the solutions for the common problem. And I think it's important to say it. It looks completely naive. It look, I know it, but I want to say it because that's the spirit that we want to, to do. Vint used an expression that is maybe not familiar to a lot of people, but when somebody with an engineering background talks about a non-trivial problem, it's an understatement. A non-trivial problem is typically what is called NP-complex problems, and these are the ones that even the smartest computers have difficulties solving. So the kind of problems that we are addressing, uh, and, uh, and Greg Nogem, who was there earlier, had a discussion with him yesterday. In engineering, there's something that is called uh, multi-factor optimization. Human brains are very apt at optimizing along one axis or potentially two axes, like combining two parameters is something that we can more or less do. Making optimization for policy making with a multiple dimension where we have to combine human rights, economic impact, long term, short term, security and so on, is one of the trickiest problems that we can, that we can imagine, especially when you are acting on one field and it has an impact on another field, you're acting in one country and it has a color, collateral impact on another one. So non-trivial is the, is the name of the game and the um, the final, uh, the final um, element is um, we, and when I say we, it's collective we, it's not only the secretariat, are confronted with a very delicate uh, issue, which is when we talk about jurisdiction, we do talk about a very important word, which is sovereignty. This is about how you exercise sovereignty. We collectively understand sovereignty in the digital age, and the problem is that we used to have a very direct and simple mapping of sovereignty with a physical territory. And today, there are cases where it is appropriate in certain circumstances that this sovereignty plays beyond the, uh, the, the, the physical territory under certain specific circumstances and criteria. 
and also other cases where you exercise the sovereignty over your own actors and operators, but with restraint, because they may have an impact on another country, and that goes for registries and registrars, major companies, and so on. So the it's not about shedding sovereignty at all. It's about understanding how it works and how it is exercised in an environment where most interactions are transborder and uh, the respective roles of and responsibilities of the different actors, which is a word that is particularly appropriate, an expression particularly appropriate in this building because it is the famous contentious wording of the, um, of the World Summit on the Information Society, is actually the underlying question. What are the respective roles and responsibilities of public, private, and civil society actors in those issues? With that, I think the next panel is, is coming. So we, we are extremely happy to have you uh, have had uh, you here. Uh, don't hesitate to connect with us if you want to know more about the, uh, the conference and potentially uh, even submit your expression of interest. It's limited in numbers, but we would be happy to extend. Thank you. Sorry, I will I will ask you to uh, to to exit so that the next panel can be can be in place and I'm sorry we over overstretched.